Hello folks, this is Steve Marinucci, Beatles Examiner, welcoming you to another Things We Said Today, um, our weekly discussion of Beetle, the Beetle world and Beetle things and whatever Beetle things we can figure out. Let me introduce who's with us today. Um, there's, we're actually one short. Ken is, is not with us uh, today, but uh, I have uh, on the other side of the world, actually the other side of the country, Mr. Alan Cozen, uh, our musicologist. Uh, good evening, Alan. Hello, Steve. Hello, everyone. And also on the East Coast from Beetle Fan Magazine, Mr. Al Sussman. Good evening, Al. Hi, Steve. Hello there, everybody. And we have a f- special guest actually back out here in California, um, our good friend, uh, Mr. Dave Morell, uh, who has just published a uh, a new a second volume of his uh, uh memoirs called um and i'm reaching for it 1974 the promotion man new york city um and he is with us on the line good evening sir good evening everybody it's really an honor and a pleasure i've followed you guys for a long long time and it's a, it's a great thrill to be a guest on the show thank you great you to have you great yeah it's really great to have you um you know i i I, I read through the book, and I'm, and the stories are just are really fantastic. Obviously, the Beatles stories are the are the big, are, you know, are the are the real attraction, you know, as far as we're concerned, too. But give everybody a rundown. I mean, since uh, you know, this is the second this is the second book of your archives. Yeah, I'll tell you real quickly. You know, I I, I looked through some notes and pieces of papers and, and ticket stubs and diaries and photographs and. All kinds of stuff that uh, you know came back to me. Actually, it was like cosmic debris that floated back to me, and it really uh, started to begin to make sense. You know, I, I sat down as an older man now in my 60s and looked at these objects and sort of pontificated to myself about them all. And then I created a puzzle on the table that said, "This is an interesting story from the time I left high school." Uh, listen to John uh, and Yoko, who had moved to America, go on the radio and be accessible. And I followed it all the time, whatever they were up to, whatever songs they were talking about, till till finally when the phones were, were opening, I would try to reach them and get through, and I did. And that was so much fun. And that really opened up the floodgates when the, the disc jockey, Howard Smith, had me on the radio because it wasn't about me. It was about the ability to have this free-form radio play uh, bootlegs and tapes that, uh, you know, when you listen to, to me on the radio, then I didn't know what they were even. But it brought together a, a unit of people that was bigger than uh, the DJ ever imagined. The mail was beyond uh, coming into him um, from Beatle collectors saying, wow, you know, I, I, I do this again. And this grew um, where, you know, I, I began a relationship with, um, with A, my, my whole story of meeting John Lennon and bringing him the, the uh, Yellow Matter Custard bootleg album, which certainly I had no clue uh, where these songs were from. Um, so that was an exciting time to be able to be that guy, you know, could have been anybody, could have been any of us that did that. I just got really lucky by writing a letter to a DJ who then in turn showed it to John. And within days, I was in front of him and meeting him. But this really led to uh, where this went, which was all great Beatle collectors. John Overall, Keith, Ron, Fermanac. I'd say Keith's last name, but that's a tough one to pronounce. And forgive me, Keith. You're part of the team. Shall I give it a try, Sluchansky? Yeah, yeah. He's he's an incredible guy, as we all know, and what he's gone through. He's an icon in my book and one of the toughest men that ever walked the planet. I love him. So uh, all of us really got together in those early days and began our journey around the Greenwich Village, antique stores, record stores, bookstores, secondhand stores, uh, used record shops. We found our way down to Canal Street. We were uncovering all kinds of uh, Beatle memorabilia. And um, what I think was really fun, for instance, to give you an example, and we've all lived this, was when John uh, played at Madison Square Garden for the one-to-one benefit concert. Because Mm -hmm. we had already started now a Beatles uh, for sale, uh, you know, memorabilia thing, Ron and I. And and from being on the radio, the mail was so excessive that I had to go from a little post office uh, slot to a big box. We were getting tons of letters. 
and having a ball with it and coming up with a little catalog. We were selling everything. Ron knew where to get the oldie singles, which uh, let me tell you a quick story about that as we roll into my story. This is a, not in my book. It's a wonderful story, though. You know, Ron being from New Jersey, I'm from New Jersey. It's just so far you can go on a bicycle to find record stores. And uh, Ron, you know, had his father drive him around. And, and of course, uh, Al will remember this uh, mm-hmm. in, in Hackensack. Absolutely. There was a store that was like a doo-wop store. The Reliquac. And it, and it turns out, uh, this is all new to me as the future rolled out, but the, uh, the Capitol Records branch managers, like Dominic, you know, Sorori, you know, mm-hmm. one of these. And he loved doo-wops. That was his scene. So he would stop over there and drop off all the new records, uh, Beatle records, and, of course, uh, and drop them off there in exchange for these doo-wop records. So Ron would walk in and, and he'd realize, he realized this. He was a teenager, a, a young teenager, most emphasis on that. Uh, and he, could, he figured out that a lot of these hard-to-get Beatles singles with picture covers were at this shop. And he realized when he looked underneath where you're not supposed to look, where the overstock is, that there were more. So he got in real action, and uh, he went to Willowbrook, and he found a box of Elvis Christmas albums on the original RCA label for a dollar each in the cutout bin. And he <laughs> begged his mother for $100 oh. and bought 100 oh. of them and, and rolled them over to Relic Rack and, and exchanged it for all these Beatles singles with picture covers. Now... If, you, if many of you or none of you have had the experience of meeting Ron and going to his home, I could tell you what a charitable man he is, was, and will always be. It's part of his character. And I know when I went there, I was humbled and uh, because I didn't have much of a Beatle collection, even though they were showing off this guy named Dave with this Beatle collection. You know, it was silly and fun. And that's what I'm all about. So when Ron saw all my stuff, he said, geez, you're missing about, let's see, there's about 20 Beatles singles. I think you're missing 16 sleeves. He says, but wait right here. (laughs) He handed me every one of them in perfect shape. I said, I don't have money for this. He says, no, I want you to have this to complete your collection. It's on me. And uh, he was always like that to other uh, people along his journey. So Ron, you know, really connected well, and, and this gave us overstock to get our collections, uh, our, you know, excessive amounts of records that we could sell and make some money and have some fun with this. But on the one-to-one benefit concert, was so much fun about that was a couple of things. One in particular was here's uh, here we are, all of us that are on this phone today, had the opportunity perhaps to see this show. Mm-hmm. And being a collector of the Beatles, we, we certainly must have thought to ourselves, what's he going to wear? What guitar is he going to play? Will he do any Beatles songs? What songs would he do? You know, the, all of these things were really mind boggling to us. And so by being in New York City, having that opportunity and going to the shows, we're able to write down all the songs. We're able to tape record the songs. We're able to take photographs of John that nobody had. And, uh, and Ron, always the man to take it to the next stage. He was a classic at this stuff. Uh, and recently, a week ago, he was over at my house here, and he said, Dave, put this DVD on, and it was uh, Elvis in June of 72. Uh, Ron loved Elvis. He loved uh, Las Vegas Elvis, and, um, and he offered me a ticket to go see The King. So I went with Ron to see Elvis, and Ron brought an 8 millimeter camera and filmed it. And uh, wow. he synced the sound up to the live at the Madison Square Garden album, and it was gorgeous. And, and he, he was here last week with over 35 minutes of Elvis footage that no one's mm. seen. Wow. That he synced up. Huh. So the fast forward, when we go to the, um, the one-to-one benefit concert, Ron uh, decided this time he was a little shaky, he thought, uh, at, at the Elvis one. He was a little shaky with the 8 millimeter. So he brought in a, a tripod, and he had it taped to his leg. And so when we got to our seats, he hooked up the tripod and put the camera on it. And now he has this absolutely stunning primo footage of John Lennon that no one's ever seen before. Oh and uh, one of the things that Ron and I are doing together, we can, uh, I'll go official with this today, is that uh, we're happy we got a little room to move. But we've been working diligently and very hard on a terrific fanzine, fan book about the one-to-one benefit concerts because we were there. We've got photographs people haven't seen, over, over 80 photographs people haven't seen, some live footage people haven't seen, um, and, and, a, and a great story. Let me share this with you. 
in my meetings with John Lennon, as you guys know, I got to get the Beetle Butcher cover. And, and one of the things that Ron and I did was we put we made T-shirts of the Beetle Butcher cover uh, and we were going to sell them at the one to one benefit concert. So we had to hand make these shirts in Ron's basement, and it was just right out of the Three Stooges and Abbott and Costello <laughs> and Carl and Hardy. You know, they were uh, paint all over us, and this thing was expensive, and we were wasting T-shirts. Maybe two out of ten would make it. You know, to a <laughs> oh. it was really something oh else, fellas. And uh, I, we started to wear these. And one time, I run into Mark Bolin from T-Rex. And it's uh, warm out because it was the summertime, and I'm wearing just my Beetle Butcher cover, and he's in a t-shirt, and Mark Bowen's wearing his gold LeMay sports coat, and he goes, hey, where'd you get that shirt? And I said, well, yeah, I made it. He goes, oh, man, I'll trade it for you for my coat. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, of course, I tried to put on his coat, and it came, you know, he was about five feet two, and I was six foot one, so it was a really silly moment. And, uh, and a month after the concert, believe it or not, uh, I got a photograph, uh, one of the few, I've got a few of me with John, and uh, this one's with me and John and Yoko, and I'm actually wearing the, the Butcher Cover t-shirt too. But anyway, we go to get a peddler's license to peddle these things, and it, that was a story and a half and a lot of fun. You know, getting Ron online to get a license is crazy, man. And he was underage, but we got our license, and uh, the day of the show, we're selling the t-shirts in between, and the police said, when you get inside, do not sell anything. And we said, okay, we won't. And so the show's about to start. Ron has never seen any of the Beatles. And all of a sudden, you know, power to the people. It's just about to go down. And some kid goes, hey, I'd like to buy a shirt. And I said, Ron, don't do it. And he did. And the cop caught him and pulled him out oh, right when no. John was hitting the stage to oh, Ron's oh, in Beetle Jail. Uh, Poor Ron. Uh, so I, I said, I'll go get him when Yoko sings. So I had to wait a couple of songs and then, <laughs> then I raced down to get him. So it was really fun. But uh, anyway, so the first book was really about what it was like to be at Ground Zero uh, on the radio and meet and greet all these other Beatle collectors. And we all gathered um, at it. We had one friend in New York City, John Overall. We'd always go to his house and he had all foreign records. And, and this led to getting Shindig films and getting uh, mm. the Beatles at Washington Coliseum. You know, a fellow by the name of Jerry Marsden, just like Jerry and the Pacemakers, wrote to me at that post office box saying that he had a, a, a print of it and he had the negative of it. And, you know, we were kids. But we, we ended up with that, and, and uh, Ron would show it around, and we'd show it to all the artists. And in, our, in, in my career in the music business with Ron, before that came out, we'd show that to Springsteen, uh, Ray Davies, uh, mm. Ray Manzarek we did it with. We, we did it with all the, all the big British, Rod Stewart. We did it with, with everybody. It was so much fun. Now, so book one uh, really is all about collecting and, and, and our lives of growing up. What's interesting is, is as we all spread, uh, I got a job through Ron Fermanac to work at a branch called Warner Electra Atlantic Records, which is a big warehouse full of records. And I started in the warehouse, the low, the low, the low job that everybody would start at. Hey, Dave. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, before you go too much further, you should actually mention the name of the first volume of the book. Ah, horse dog. Yes. I called it horse dog because I thought it was clever, funny, and it would be in Funk and Wagnall's dictionary immediately. <laughs> uh, two years later, I, I can't get off. It was a bad start. Tough name. Nobody gets it. I gotta, you know, it, I gotta own that. I do. I gotta chew down on it. It's called horse dog, and I love it. And you know, I went to the my sales department today, which is me in front of my computer, and it actually uh, is, is selling. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted and commented, uh, not under my breath, to a group of people that, wow, look what's happening. So yeah. I'm really thrilled that it's selling, that it did well, uh, that my uh, English teacher, who's long been dead, she was about 118 when she taught me, uh, didn't send it back to me with a C minus and say, don't try this again, Morel. <laughs> so uh, I'm pleased about that. And uh, what really worked for, for, the, for the book w was about the stories and, uh, and, the, and the factual part of those. I think that really drove that book. So mm -hmm. I'm thrilled about that. And, and real quick, the book ends where I'm working in the warehouse uh, of the record company. But, you know, just to catch us up, here's me. I get in the record business for 40 some years. I'm still here. Ron, you know, he went on to do This Is Elvis, The Kids Are All Right, Imagine, The Beatles Anthology, you know, 200 Capital Collector Series CDs, Grammy nomination with the Les Paul box set. 
it's unbelievable what he has accomplished. And if you look at Keith, uh, here's a kid who uh, spent his days uh, running around uh, the, the village and everywhere finding records, and he ends up with his own record shop uh, on 8th Street, which was, you know, the Casablanca, the Casbah for the oh, music, yeah. where you got Absolutely. your sandals, your incense, yeah. your pizza, your pot, everything you desired was on 8th Street, man. Mm -hmm. The girls were there, the fringe jackets were there, the beetle boots were there, <laughs> yeah. and Electric Ladyland was across the street. Right. And... Uh, and there were many times in Keith's store, I'll just leave, drop this one on you, where, um, I don't want to say her name, worked at Electric Lady, and she'd see the light burning across the street on the second floor, and would come over at 2.30 in the morning and say, you know, hey, Jeff Beck just left, he was working over at Electric Lady, you want to come back and hear the tapes? And we'd rush right <laughs> over. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my And then I'll wrap this up before we chat and open it up for you guys. I'm sorry I'm talking so much. Is that my oh, news? that's right is 1974, The Promotion Man, New York City. And it's really a, a book about a young kid getting into New York City, getting a job, finding his feet on the streets of New York and how to get to where and where things are and how the whole turf and grid of New York works. And uh, one of the toughest jobs in the world, getting records played, a tough, tough bunch of goons I had to work with uh, who were other promotion men. And, um, uh, d delightful that I had the opportunity to be so young and given such a great chance. And of course, in the second book, when things got tough and I needed to lean on, on, on you know, my moral upbringing, my sounds and, and my emotions, I'd always lean on the Beatles. And of course, John being in New York led me to run into John in, a, in such a uh, outpouring of uh, positive emotions coming from John and creativity from the Walls and Bridges to the rock and roll album to being with him on his birthday to uh, you know seeing him perform at Madison Square Garden and then wrapping it up at the end of the year in California it was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Al, you want to you want to ask some? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, Dave and I have uh, kind of a, a similar history uh, because we uh, we both spent a lot of time. In the uh, in the late '60s and early '70s, hanging out in uh, various and sundry record stores, you know, not just in the village, but also in in North Jersey. And in fact, every once in a while, Dave will suddenly pop up on my Facebook page with an old survey from Corvettes or Gimbals <laughs> or one of those places that are really fascinating to look at. But give us just kind of a pe a picture, because you know this is 40 years ago. 41 years ago we're talking and give us a picture of what the record business was like the record business and the record industry was like in 1974 because it was kind of like the wild west it was like anything goes and it was and, you know i found it to be very difficult uh, personally for my ears for, hmm. for one reason we had moved we had all moved over to fm where the djs weren't stepping on the intros and the outros mm -hmm. to the records they weren't power driven. It was a softer tone. Even those Wildcats like Murray the K, Scott Muni, all top 40 uh, jocks were now moving to the FM side of the dial and really whispering it and letting the records play out. Mm -hmm. Plus, we weren't getting the hiss on the records and we were hearing stereo recordings for the first time. I'll never forget when I heard um, years later when um, Zachary, the great ghoul Zachary, sure. uh, radio dropped the needle on Rubber Soul and played that stereo version with that skipped intro of I'm Looking Through You. Right. And I, I couldn't believe my ears. I'd never heard a, a natural Beatles sound that I was familiar with not go the right way in perfect quality. And I, I drove him nuts because to him, because I called and I finally, after a week or two, got him on the phone. I had it, I drove him nuts. I really mean I drove him that poor man crazy over this and, and and the reason i'm saying it's so profound that it was crazy to him was to him he was a dj that couldn't give a rat's ass <laughs> a rubber soul album and an, and an album cover it was nothing special he, he sure. wasn't handed an acetate and, and, and told not to say anything he just played the record that was in front of him and doesn't know what i'm talking about so that was fun but it's funny when i was in that warehouse there at Warner Lecture Atlantic, uh, my ears were open to um, everything that was going on at Top 40 Radio, WABC, WNBC, 
and, uh, and and the records that were driving up those charts, and you know, they weren't friendly to my ears. You know, there were a few I liked, but I was really an FM guy. Mm -hmm. So it was a really a tough task uh, to be asked to work the top 40 songs in New York City at the time. I really expected to go into, come out of the elevator at WABC and go into a room of guys that look like the Beach Boys that wanted good vibrations, incense, mm, yeah. <laughs> um, talked about records they liked, B-sides, what concerts they were going to. And I walked into, I walked out of the elevator and it was like off-track betting on a bad day. Mm. It was, you know, it was like a bunch of goons in, in, in raincoats with uh, two-inch thick glasses that were real brutes um, and, uh, you know, real, uh, real bulls and, um, and they were talking about records in a way that I never understood before. They were talking about chart numbers and uh, sales and not about the sound or the group. So there was a real identification problem there. So when I walked in, it was really tough going. I really went out of my way to mention in my book uh, about Tommy James' book, uh, The Mob, The Music, mm -hmm. and Me. Mm -hmm. He talked about being ripped off by the mob in the music business, never being paid. And um, in one chapter, he ends it with saying, by 1974, and that's when I entered the door, right. uh, things had changed, and it wasn't like that. And uh, I was lucky because I was a fan uh, previous uh, to, at WABC, as you know, we all were growing up and listening to those playlists and, and those great years. Mm -hmm. So when I met Rick Sklar, you know, I was a fan, and he was a business guy that... Um, was either taking was making huge ABC corporate decisions during the day with a suit and a tie, uh, handling the air staff, the uh, account managers, everything. He was a very very powerful man, and the last thing he wanted to do was get caught by these goons talking uh, records that were coming up the charts. You know, sure. that's why Rick had a music director. Yeah. But you know, when I met him, and I talked about the Beatles and all kinds of fun stuff, the Mona Lisa contest, the biggest Mona Lisa, the littlest Mona Lisa, all those crazy contests. Uh, he was really open to saying, sit down, you know, I thought of that. You know, let me tell you more. I, I'm, the, I'm the guy behind the scenes. I'm the Wizard of Oz. I pull the strings. And then he'd play me a tape and he'd, he'd say, now listen to this. He says, this is the tape where, where we made all the, all the, ABC, all the ABC Beatle commercials. And he'd say, I'll put the tape on and you'll be able to hear it. And he started the tape and it'd be Rick speaking and he'd say, WABC, the Beatles are the best. WABC, the Beatles are the best. Mm -hmm. And he'd whisper, WABC, home of the Beatles. WABC, he'd have the jock doing it. And he was so entertaining to me. So at that time, I had to get back into those top 40 records. And when I had to examine each playlist, I had to figure out how many R&B records they were playing, how many pop records they were playing, how many duets they were playing, and how my record could fit in with them. And what even made my job mentally tougher was the first record I promoted. I thought I wanted it to be like a Chuck Berry, a Little Richard, a, a classic song that's on every jukebox known to man. And it was Midnight at the Oasis by Maria Moulton. <laughs> it made me choke. <laughs> that was not an easy record uh, to bring to a record. You know, having a uh, night in the desert on a waterbed wasn't uh, the music he was playing at the time. Yeah. Um, so that really opened up my mind to how to how to how to work that and work Rick. And you know, I had such fun experiences in my life. I just want to tell you two quick funny ones. One was. Uh, one time, the guy that taught me how to do the job, he had that song, Dueling Banjos. Um, <laughs> and uh, Rick listened to it, and it was too slow, and it went too long. So my friend uh, Mike, he took it, and he sped it up to about 48 RPMs to make sure it would fit. <laughs> <laughs> so they were playing it like Mickey Mouse. And when the two artists came up to play it in his office, uh, Rick started tapping his feet, saying, come on, boys, pick it up. This doesn't sound like the record. <laughs> Uh, so, so those were fun times. Uh, Dave, let me let me ask you about that the, the how do you do it uh, story in the book. Sure. I mean, that's such a that's such a great story. I mean, you didn't have any idea when John pulled out that that record that no. that's he, he was going to play. No, um, I'll take it over here. You know, first off, being a kid and, and reading the authorized biography of the Beatles by Hunter Davies, that was quite a, a book. It was a, that was the that was a must read 
a really happening book, great stuff. It's the first time the words uh, Beatles, smoking pot were really put in print and, mm -hmm. and truthful. And nobody ever said that before. There's not any mention of that in any text I ever read until that book. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that book, he took you through so many stages, the early days with Sutcliffe and, and, the, and the letters that he had all the way to uh, how they wrote a song together with a little help from my friends. He, he was a witness to that and wrote it beautifully and stunningly. And it was in that book that he talked about the How Do You Do It song. And uh, it was in my mind, and I'd always hear Jerry and the Pacemakers wondering, you know, I thought the Jerry and the Pacemakers did it great, and I thought the Beatles must have done it exactly like that. So, um, you know, in, 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 I was thinking about this earlier when I, in, when I wrote the book, to think that the day in our lives, it happened to me and Ron, uh, even to Derek Taylor, maybe he had plans, but we certainly, when I woke up this morning, that morning, couldn't have imagined I'd be sitting on John Lennon's bed, turning him on in a great, great, great mood that he was in that evening. You know, he was, he was, he had just had uh, walls and bridges in his hand and was showing it to us how it opened up and uh, we talked about it at length he played uh, he got up and he played number nine dream really loud like mm. we weren't allowed to play records loud but this was his record at his place and he cranked it and it washed over us uh, like a just like a, a tidal wave of, 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 of a wall of music that sounded tremendous to us and it's funny when he came out of that song I had the courage and strength to say to him, who produced that? And he said, I did. What are you talking about? I said, well, geez, I got to be honest with you. It doesn't sound anything like Pussycats or Mind Games. <laughs> you know, I thought those were really thinner and tinnier. I mean, this had a real full sound. And then he said, uh, I, I felt bad, but he got defensive and said that he had made those for AM stereo, uh, the, that he was mixing them for AM stereo that he thought was going to be the next big thing. <laughs> But what really rolled this along, and it doesn't get talked about a lot, and I should have done a better job about it, was that you have to consider something. John Lennon wasn't with Yoko Ono, and I'd been with him and Yoko several times. Let's call it several times. And when she was around him, she was an intellectual woman who wasn't really interested in a kid talking to John about rock and roll. You know, that wasn't her scene. And um, it could end abruptly with her. But he was with May. And she wasn't even with us on the bed. And, and so when John was talking about the new rock and roll album that he'd been working on, we were just really intense about what songs he chose and everything about rock and roll. And there was no stopping John. There was no uh, Yoko to turn it off, man. He was full on. Now, consider this. He's full on talking about these records and these artists. And I, I, I didn't know anything about Larry Williams, really. And he told us all about Larry Williams, Dizzy Miss Lizzie, Slow Down, Bad mm -hmm. Boy, Tony Maloney. I mean, wow, this guy's not even in a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And the influence on John Lennon is enough. But, uh, we, of course, we had the uh, Washington Coliseum movie. And John got so turned on by this movie, uh, he just was lit. The night was young. He had new music, and this is when he said, you know, look at this. And he pulls out this acetate, in, a, an envelope that was all like pizza stain, dirty, a big yellow manila envelope. And inside of that was a cleaner one, and inside of that was this acetate. Now, what was strange was, I forgot to mention, but right before he played Number 9 Dream, he said his stereo wasn't working. And Ron said, I'll fix it. And he got up and fixed it. And John was so happy. Even you or I would be happy if somebody came in and fixed your damn stereo. <laughs> mm -hmm. and that's a big. It's like getting the TV to work. So uh, John was really happy. And um, when we were showing him the movies, just one last sidecar. You guys there? Yeah. <laughs> I was there. We have it. Sal's train. When we were showing the movie, John said, "What else have you got?" And Ron started talking about Elvis Presley stuff. And John Lennon had never seen these Elvis clips in England, you know, so to have actually have them and speak about them was just, you know, you guys are coming back. And the other key thing about Ron, again, we touched on was he was a young teenager, unable to drive. And Ron Fermanac worked in these oldie stores down in the village. And he had like 50 records with picture sleeves before 1964. So when he was with John Lennon, he wasn't a dazed out kid 
with a, with a with a pencil and a pad pushing it in his face for an autograph. He was down and dirty with every one of those records that John talked about or knew about. So there was either us sharing or John sharing, and all of us in the kitty together like a heavy card game. Mm. And it was at this point that John, you know, turned us on and uh, began to tell us about how do you do it and how the Beatles uh, were, you know, that George Martin had found the record, wanted them to record it. John didn't want to record it. And when he was telling me the story, I was kind of pushing back mentally because I was wondering, why is he not like, I love that record. What's he pushing back for? And then he'd say he didn't think Beatle fans, you know, at the Cavern would like it. Now, I wasn't a Beatle fan at the Cavern to know what they'd like or not like or that they were in leather and, and more bluesy. You know, to me, this was a great song. But he said, no, I, we really didn't like it and I didn't sing it to the best of my ability. And at that point, you know, he dropped that needle and man, it, it was unbelievable to hear it and to open, you know, it's again, like wide eyed, bushy tail, look at him and say, I'm looking at John Lennon and he's playing it and I'm really here and I'm hearing it. Mm -hmm. I, re I, I, I mentioned this, this on the show before our local station here in the uh, Bay Area played it you know, the years before it got released on the anthology, you know, I mean, decades, you know, a decade, at least a decade before. And I remember sitting in my car waiting for it to come on. And it mm. was, it was a made thing. Alan, I'm sorry. I interrupt. I got in front of you. I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. Did you have a question you wanted to, to hit Dave with? I had some observations. I, I've got to say that for someone who doesn't know the ins and outs of the way the music industry works, this is a, a really thin book, 107 pages, but it takes you right in there. And mm -hmm. um, totally mm -hmm. apart from the Beatles stuff, which is great, um, and and turns up very frequently in the book, and is, you know, stories like Dave just told about showing John the Washington Coliseum film and hearing, how do you do it? I mean, apart from that, there are things in here like, you know, Dave talks about taking notes um, at the early meetings about mm -hmm. what a promo guy is supposed to do. In the, uh, Dave, I think those are like all your notes, right, that are in the book. Yes. It's like a complete... I, I deliberately put those in there to bore the hell out of everything. No, no, no. <laughs> no. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe in Norway. <laughs> at the end of the meeting, which would then lead you to the breath of fresh air seeing the Crawdaddy magazine with John Lennon. It was stupendously a massive headache and I'd wish that I was back in the warehouse just picking and packing records. Yeah, and yeah, said it. Sure. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? For someone who's sort of interested in the way the record industry works, and, and I mean, I knew an awful lot of these guys, I, I mean, apart from you, <laughs> um, and but I never really sort of knew what their job in, entailed. And um, those notes, I mean, it's, it's a total course in 1970s mm -hmm. record promotion. It's, so I'm glad you included it, even if you thought it was going to bore people. It was just great. Um, and the other thing, there's this great suspense. I mean, I'm getting to like the last couple of pages of the book and I'm saying, man, he's mentioned this Christmas bonus about 15 times and he's not going to tell us what it is until like the last page. So, uh, yeah, good. Structurally, Dave, got to tell you, good book. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You but, know, uh, I, I really got wound up when I found the memorabilia to make this, uh, 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 to put this in one year. Yeah, um, and ended. I thought, geez, this is just. I got everything I need, and that ending with being at the ball game in L.A., <laughs> seeing John, um, and then that bonus because I found the, the the letter, and you know, I wanted professional help in my writing. I wanted everybody to laugh. I I'm not a comedic writer. I'm not even a writer. You know, I'm just trying to put out the best I can do, give on the, with the tools I've got, and I hope to do better. I really do. But with that in mind. There's a couple of guys that are really famous out here that are comedians, and I and I happen to know them, and I and I said I got to get together with you. I, I need you know a punched up. I need a punched up end here. I really want people to laugh, mm -hmm. and they and they said oh meet me for coffee, and I said yeah I got this idea. It's really it feels good, but I don't think I'm the I got the firecracker, and he goes let's see what you got. This is good. This is good. Use that, and I say oh really. And then, you know, I went to another guy and I said, you know, I, I, you know, I'll pay you, you know, it's just one joke, like, like Bob Hope, you know, he paid for jokes. And mm -hmm. uh, the guy said, no, you got it. So thank you, Alan, for saying that. So how, how many more volumes are you going to do? Um, is, is, how far I'll are you going you exactly. to take it? That's a great question. And first, I want to say that uh, truthfully and honestly, 
I had the structure of Worst Dog and built and done, and it was really a, a part one, and I wasn't going to end it there, but I had to. Uh -huh. So that's why it was a thinned out volume one, and then, then this volume two, you know, this massive stuff. And plus, I had worked very hard and diligently in, in providing a huge new kind of book uh, that I wanted to present to everybody that had audio in it um, with me and John talking. Uh, I wanted it to have the photographs, but I fell into all those legalities and gray areas, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's very mm. tough. I mean, when you're the Warner Brothers guy, let's say, and Warner Brothers says, you know, hire a photographer to take a picture of you at, at a radio station with somebody, you know, and then, you know, 40 years later you want to use a book. I don't own that image because I didn't take that picture, even though mm. that guy got paid. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it didn't work for me, but it made me work harder on, on the book. Now, yeah. to bring you guys ahead, I'm very excited because I'm really feeling, uh, if you're interested in the subjects I'm speaking about, of course there'll be less Beatles in a moment uh, in my next book, but then it'll pick up, but let me share this with you. The next book, I finish off my year, at, I finished in 1975 at Warner Brothers, having an incredible year there from uh, Fleetwood Mac finally busting after all mm, those years. Sure. Uh, Rod Stewart with Atlantic Crossing, one of the nicest mm -hmm. people you ever want to meet, ever, and he, he loves rock and roll, he knows the clothes he had on, the concert set list, mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a treat to be with, and uh, of course I was with him then, you know, he hadn't uh, gone uh, the way he's gone, people have left him, he was really so great, mm -hmm. so that's all in there, then, you know, the, I thought it was a clunker, you, you, uh, but it wasn't, but it, I thought the Four Seasons, Who Loves You, was a real clunker, but, but it wasn't, <laughs> so I, I go there, but then, you know, I go to RCA, and um, RCA is very strict, strict building, almost suit and ties, you know, security cameras on each floor, completely different from the wild townhouse of Warner Brothers. And I remember I was just talking to the guy today, Bruce Sommerfeld, who was the head of A&R, or one of the A&R guys under Mike Berniker, who, who produced People by Barbara Streisand. He, I'll never forget that my first day at RCA, I had really long hair, wearing crazy clothes. And he says, Dave, I want you to meet somebody who's going to be so happy and not like he was working for us. Please meet Lou Reed. You know, so oh, I go, wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. And by the end of the day, I'm telling you, as far as you could swing a pendulum, at four o'clock that afternoon, they said, "Come on up to the, to, to, come on upstairs, the executive office. We're having a big party. You know, you're the new guy. Come on up." But David Cassidy's there, and he's <laughs> looking at me, going, "Oh my God, I'm going to have a shot now, getting some FM airplay." So it was. So, so there's that. Now in that year, though, I got into country music a big uh, in a big way. You know, Dolly Parton, that Outlaws mm -hmm. album with Willie Nelson and sure. Waylon Jennings was one of the first gold records or you know platinum records in yep. the country. It was huge. Hall and Oates breaks, uh, a couple of sidecars break. Uh, Vicky Sue Robinson turns the beat around. Dr. Buzzard Savannah Band kicks in. These aren't big names, but underneath all of that texture, you got Lou Reed, you got David Bowie. We're going down a great path here as we roll. And of course, one of my favorite stories is Elvis. Sure. The King's last album. And I'll never forget racing this over to Scott Muni and Dennis Elsis, and they wanted to hit me with a two by four saying, we're not playing Elvis Presley as long as I ever live. Huh. This guy stinks. And I said, it's Elvis Presley. Just play it. Say there's a new Elvis album out and hit. Let everybody else say that. You're not opinion makers. Drop the needle on the king. Wouldn't do it. It was low down. You know, a year later, he dies. I'm listening to the radio. Scott Muni crying. <laughs> <laughs> he lost Elvis. Got his last record here called Low Down. <laughs> going to play it now. I wanted to smack him with a two by four, the nut. So we're going we're gonna to meet the king and do the Elvis boogie, and that was a wonderful thing. And then I moved to uh, Arista, where I meet the triumphant of nutcases, Patti Smith, Iggy Pop, and Lou again. <laughs> Hello! Well, How I survived those years, I'll never wow. know. Plus the so Dave, that again, plus the kinks again. Thank you. So does the next volume have Mike McCartney in it? No. I, uh, you know, <laughs> I'll tell you, what's interesting about that name is this. He really wasn't part of that story mm. um part one right and to double check that um because i'm not a, a that kind of person mm -hmm. um he wasn't part of that that whole evening he really mentally physically w wasn't there derek in 50 years adrift doesn't even mention uh, you know that he that he signed and brought him on unless i'm dreaming you know th there's no there's nothing there huh. so um 
And uh, in, in my case, I personally felt in, uh, that as a young boy who, who, who often cut school and went to TV shows, I happened to be at the David Frost show when those guys stumbled out of the taxi cab and recognized them. I mean, how, what, what is that? You know, mm -hmm. and, and, they, and they were happy that they were recognized. Years later, I found out that after Epstein dropped them as management, David Frost took them on as management, and that's how they got the gig. You know, but then, you know, he took a shot at us in his book, and rather than uh, be revengeful, I just felt, you know, it wasn't necessary to, uh, to, to bring him in. And no, we won't be talking about him. And thirdly, I, I want to put it to bed so that everybody feels comfortable about this. I knew who he was. And I knew how good that record was, and I worked that record hard, and I did a great job for that. Oh. But I also, and you guys know me, did the mm -hmm. same thing for Badfinger, uh, T-Rex, and yeah. even fans at Warner's didn't care about breaking in New York. It was never a national priority. Ronnie Wood was a big part of my book. Mm -hmm. He might have had the best shot of those four I just mentioned, because he got to go on that promotional tour to at least six cities. But Badfinger, two albums, no mentions. T Rex, yeah. I love that. Slade, I was a sucker for that stuff. And my yeah. Motley Crue stole it and made a career out of it. Uh, sure. <laughs> Slade, you couldn't talk about Slade in, in uh, being a You couldn't step out of, out of those rules of breaking artists. And you know, in my book, it's all about Little Feet, Tower Power, which were bands that were forced on me. And, and if I hadn't worked at Warner's, they would have never gotten on my radar screen, and I'm proud to say they were tremendous records and great uh -huh. bands. Uh -huh. and, and just to finish off Alan's question, because I'm really proud to share this with everybody. I'm really proud. I wish any of you guys were here. I say this totally stand up, no sense of humor. The book on Capitol Records, a decade there. Oh, yeah. Fellas, yeah. you won't believe what I've got. I mean it. I've got, I tape recorded the conference calls. I'm going through them. I'm, I'm raging through this, drilling through this cement on a terrific masterpiece. I know you'll like it. When's yeah. now? When's that part? When's the capital? That's probably. I'm going to do. I'm going to be forced to do this third book. Um, you know, I was really wanted to skip and do the capital book because it's so entertaining. But I got to go back and get grounded down by Clive Davis and a few, uh, mm. you know, nutcases <laughs> out there. Uh, so uh, I, I don't en I don't enjoy that. But I've got to tell it at like a, like I saw it, and so I'm into it. But that's got to come first. So I'm looking at next. I'm you know my my you know I'm I'm surprising myself. I'm hoping I could do one a year. So I'm looking at doing four, uh, and then doing a box set with a fifth volume of all. Uh, tidbits of cool things I, I, I thought I could use as bonus chapters when the book went to number one, but of course it hasn't, so the bonus chapters will be used in another fashion. Bonus chapters, bonus chapters, there, there is a concept of a record business guy writing a book. <laughs> bonus chapters. We'll have to, we'll have to, I'm going to have to remember that. Yeah, the capital. I'm, I'm looking forward to the capital stuff too, because that's when I, that's when I met you in like 83 or so. Um, yes, that, it was marvelous meeting you, and you had the tape. You were you were a great friend, and and I don't mean to cut in, but uh, Alan will be a big part of uh, the experience. To I needed a witness when I went to Albert Goldman's house. Oh God, I was working oh. on Lennon's book, and I said to myself, I, I don't believe I'm. This is happening. I've got to bring somebody who will who when I write about it in the future, they'll, they'll make no mistake that the man I. I Alan Cozen from the New York Times to meet this cuckoo magoo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got to, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't just talk about this and, and drop it off. I don't know what you're, I don't know what you guys are referring to. You got to oh, tell we, us. We, tell you, we spent I'll, a pleasant I'll, afternoon I'll, with Albert. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you, I, before I brought Alan into it, I got a call from Albert Goldman and he was looking for some research material on, on Yoko and John. I got the call at Capitol. I knew he was a goon from his Elvis book. Uh, I went to meet him. He swore up and down that uh, it, it was going to be a, a James Dean iconic, incredible book. That John had no secrets, and he was really the true rebel. We all, we all, it was like Marlon Brando, and he really had a way of bending that of what he was going to accomplish. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're, you're saying Albert uh, Albert Grossman? That's not who you're talking. Goldman. Albert Goldman. 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 Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. I get confused because I worked with Albert <laughs> Smith. Uh, I worked with those guys. Uh, anyway, oh, okay. back to Goldman's book. So he, um, he, he, it obviously we all know it's a rubber band of Cynthia's book and this book and that book. Right. Washed into a hamburger. But at the time when I met him, I saw that he was uh, a, a guy I wasn't comfortable with. He was. Uh, 
Benjamin Franklin, very curmudgeon. Um, it wasn't it, it wasn't easy uh, being being around him because his theories weren't working on my brain. Mm. So I said clearly, I don't want my name in your book. I don't want to accept any money from you. Uh, I'll give you these few things. And he wanted some Yoko clippings. And you know what I had? I found the Everson Art Museum the pamphlet from, from, from Syracuse. And in it was about 16 little clippings. And rather than hand it to him, I photostatted each one like I did 16 research projects for him and handed it to him. Uh, meanwhile, I was confronted him and said, listen, uh, what I would like uh, in, in, in regards to helping you is um, the research material. I know you're not a, a Beatle fan or a John Lennon fan. And he said, okay. And, um, you know, Alan, I think Alan may have seen some stuff and we shared some stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's what I walked out with. And then, uh, you know, Alan got a chance to, to, to meet the big man and, and Alan can challenge the best of them. So those two were really uh, arm wrestling over there. It was kind of fun, yes. And then when the book came out, it was even more fun because <laughs> I had to interview him. Really? And, um, mentioned the the day that we were there and the things that he said and claimed that weren't true and uh but it's funny i mean the day that i met dave actually was kind of funny because i had he was at capitol and i had gone up to emi to interview one of their um classical players since that's what i was writing about and um the, the classical promo guy had taken this guy out to lunch and they had a bit too much wine and forgot about the interview and I'm just sort of sitting there and his secretary comes out and says, uh, so I'm sorry, is there anything I can help you with? And I said, yeah, when are you going to le release Leave My Kitten Alone? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, well, uh, I'll tell you what, um, when Dave Morell gets back from lunch, I'll introduce you to him. And I said, Dave Morell? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, yeah, Dave Morell, he's our, our pop promo guy. And I and so I was introduced to Dave, and the first thing I said to Dave was, were you on the Howard Smith show when you were like 15? Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was very, I mean, it was, talk about a weird small world, you know? I mean, I listened to that show when it was on, taped it, you know? But um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the capital stuff, obviously, because uh, that puts you right in the orbit of uh, several fabs. Yes, so, uh, yes, yes, yes. And it'll bring. And, and, and by the way, you know, I really want to write a righteous, truthful, unbelievable uh, story. How you know, in order of the butcher cover, mm -hmm. and uh, you know what happens, and Paul and being with him that day and showing it to him, and he, he mm -hmm. was flipped out seeing the Beetle Butcher cover that John had signed. He really mm. marveled at the sight of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. He was great. Yeah. Dave, you talk, in the, you talk in the book about the Let It Be tapes. Um, yeah. Talk about that story, too. Cause, sure. Uh, we, uh, Richard DeLello, who wrote The Longest Cocktail Party, stopped up at Warner Brother Records one day. I heard his name being announced on the, uh, at the reception desk, and he was going up to see Joe. Joe Bergman worked at Warner Brother Records in the Artist Relations Department, and before she joined us, she had worked with Tony Barrow, uh, the Be Beatles PR uh, agent, um, in the earliest days of the Beatles. Um, she knew Epstein, all those people. She has Tony Barrow's 1963 desk diary. She has some incredible memorabilia wow. that's so uh, uh, incredible that nobody's seen before. She's been in a, it's been in a trunk that she sits on for 50 <laughs> years. Uh, that's she has a blanket on her trunk, and that's a that's her, that's her chair. Uh, she went on to work with the Rolling Stones. You can see her throughout the movie "Give Me Shelter." Uh, she's the key the person in the Rolling Stones organization, uh, Joe Bergman. And when I met her at Warner Brothers, uh, we hit it off great. And within that one year of that I wrote the book, because of her, I met uh, Neil Aspinall, Derek Taylor, John Kosh, who designed all the cover, you know, some of the covers, Ethan Russell, who photographed him in the end, and then De and Richard DeLello. And uh, he was uh, he was a scary guy. He was like an Eric Roberts in. Uh, in the Pope of Greenwich Village, you know, really high wired and uh, and speedy and scary. Um, but once we hit it off, he was one of the most gentle, wonderful guys I ever met. And I brought Ron Fermanac with me to say, we got to go meet Richard DeLello. He's got all these pictures from Apple. He had he had um, Agnes McBean, these color color positive negatives, about five by seven inches. The Beatles leaning over the railing in 19, you know, mm. the future shot 
<laughs> with the, these different velour suits that weren't the, the picture that I'd seen before, the striped suit. They were solid color, and it was gorgeous. And he gave me one. We made a beautiful light box out of it. He had um, photographs he had taken of Ringo. Um, he was on set for the Instant Karma video. He signed uh, White Trash. He was on the roof with Badfinger. So we went to his house up in Suffern, New York, and he was uh, hanging with Andy Andy Dalton, who was David Dalton's wife, and another woman named Margo. And uh, as we were talking, he said, check out this box. And he had these five and seven inch tapes. And he had a tape recorder and we put it on and I really almost fainted. I'd never heard in the human being's home, never mind a recording studio, recordings of this superior quality of the Beatles. And uh, some of the reels were at one seven eighths, which was very slow, but they were still incredible. There was so much packed on them. Some were three and three quarters and some were seven and a half. And the quality was beyond. And he was very gracious in saying that we could copy these. And um, for several years, I'm not kidding. I'm not saying days and I'm not saying months. I'm saying years, at least three to four years. You know, we would just listen to these and try to make sense of them. When I, whenever I got a cold, I'd lay on the couch and put the tape on and just, you know, nod off with the Beatles for seven hours kind of stuff. <laughs> sure. And uh, we began to understand, we started to look at it like, what if we were Phil Spector and were handed this? Let's see, you know, because obviously it seemed to us that Phil Spector didn't go very far in listening to anything. He was probably given the best of the lot and made the best out of that. But we found... Uh, clippings and bits and other songs and them having fun and we thought we could create our own album so we did find better versions of all the songs he chose and put them in that order or what we thought were better you know we don't know and then we did an album of takes we uh, that we thought were the greatest and then we picked stuff that you know we thought nobody had ever heard and we ended our album with paul saying uh it's all very funny, you know. The Beatles broke up because Yoko sat on an amp. Click. <laughs> That's how we were going to end it. And yeah. um, and now, you know, I, I know there's so much material out. I still think there's an album's worth of great material in there, fun stuff with the Beatles in a great positive mood. And I hope Paul opens it up and reevaluates that material one day. Mm-hmm. So was did the, did he have the entire set of Nagra reels? We, you know, um, that would be a question for Ron, who had. Uh, well, they're not. They weren't Nagra reels. They were another brand. So I'm thinking. But it's uh, that I'm material, kind of, right? I mean. Yes. It's, it's, what we were told at the time was that David Dalton. This, thank you for bringing that up. David Dalton was in charge with another guy, David Dalton, and I'll think of it in a moment. But when the Beatles were doing the Let It Be book that came with the album, it was out in England and Canada. Um, there was dialogue in the in the, in the book, right. and so they were given these tapes to go through and to do the dialogue. As a matter of fact, here's a newie for you, but I, I, I was told this years and years ago, I never saw it in print, but John Kosh and Ethan Russell, who designed the book and photographed the book, um, they said that originally the idea was that John would be in red, in red ink, Paul would be in blue ink, you know, so when you read the book, it wouldn't say John's talking, Paul's talking, it would mm. be in these color inks, mm. and uh, so that's where all of these tapes came from. And also, it's funny, each page in the Let It Be booklet is a, a single page with photographs, but in the center of the book is the only picture that's a double truck full, the whole size, and it's uh, Yoko passed out under the piano. They did that <laughs> deliberately. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, that, I mean, that book That book was funny because I don't know about yours, but but uh, I think the bindings on all of them fell all apart. Them yeah, fell apart. I think yeah, so. Hard to find it sealed on that one and a real quick tidbit to the end of Richard Richard uh, came out to California lives in Bel Air and wrote a Popeye Doyle a follow up to the French connection mm-hmm. and he did very well for himself and uh, you know uh, he even did uh, one of the Michael Jackson videos I think Bad Bull, Bad was one of his that he might have written mm. yeah you mentioned a couple of the things that he had done uh, and I was surprised because I wasn't aware that he had done that stuff I was going to ask you and I don't want to get too far off the subject since we've yeah. been basically talking about Beatles but when you talk about Warner Brothers you mentioned you were with Ron Wood for I've Got My Own Album to do with George which George is on yeah. and that's a, that's a wonderful album but did you I have to ask because I was a big Faces fan did you ever work with the Faces oh my god one of my favorite groups in the whole wide world <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, they were so much fun, and that's why I said when I met Rod Stewart, uh, I said to him, 
hey, uh, last time, one of the gigs I saw at the Faces was in Jersey City at the Stanley Theory. He goes, I remember it. I go, I'm not even done talking yet. Hold on. He goes, no, I remember that show. We did two shows there. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, you told the audience at the first crowd if they wanted to stay. And he goes, yeah, yeah, go upstairs. You can stay for free. I go, yeah, I was at that show. He goes, yeah, I remember it. I was wearing these red shoes, these blue socks. I had on these yellow pants. I said, come on. <laughs> so the Faces were really big in my life. And what's really right. funny was, as I mentioned to you guys about there's there, there's all of us with our own personalities and records we love and we want to push, mm -hmm. and we know that the guy that we're pushing records on would want to know this information. Mm -hmm. So I was so fortunate that um, the guy that was doing the albums was on vacation and I was in charge. And uh, because of that record, uh, having Mick Jagger on it and George Harrison on it, I was able to go to uh, Scott Muni Things from England and nudge my way in the door. And plus with Dennis Elsis, who, um, you know, liked Emmett, Emmett, um, what was Emmett's name? Emmett Rhodes. Oh, and those sure. kind of Beatles sound. Oh, yeah. Things. I knew he might give me a shot on this. And I was a young kid and I played it off of, um, you know, uh, George Harrison and Mick Jagger. And I think Rod Stewart was on it too. And so he fell in, you know, he said, yeah, now you can come by and now we'll play the record. And what's so funny is, uh, I didn't put it in the book, but uh, that evening, Ronnie had a, a videotape and he, oh, I think I did put it in the book. And it was of uh, his, it, it, Warner Brothers had paid for him to do one solo show in England and he, and he got Rod Stewart to come on. And I don't know if they ever showed it, but, you know, we, we had it that night and, and looked at it. It was a lot of fun to, to be, it's always a lot of fun to be with artists when they're watching themselves on the screen and critiquing it that way. That was a ball run and, and mm -hmm. the faces. There was one one show I saw the faces several times, but there was one show I'll never forget in Berkeley. I don't know if you were at that show, Dave, at the Berkeley Community Theater. In the middle of I think it was Plinth, um, when Ronnie Wood was doing his solo, uh, Rod Stewart and Ronnie Lane went backstage and they came out with this big sheet and they unfurled it and it was the holiday in flag they had <laughs> stolen it. <laughs> <laughs> It was that was so fantastic. That was fantastic. I was going to also ask you to give me the worst record you ever had to promote. And how did you how did you deal with it? Wow. You know, um, there were many of them, and um, certainly I, I really believe. I know it's hard to say because it was such a hit, but that Midnight at the Oasis was tough to swallow. <laughs> it, it just you know I even went out of my way in the book to write about it. How uh, Rolling Stone, um, John Landau, who was a writer then, thought it was thought it was jazzy. Another key writer thought it was bluesy. Uh, no, in other words, I'm, I'm enabling myself to hear uh, people who have credibility that are reviewers unable to come to a, a point with it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it was a conservative year that year. The Sister Mead had a record. It was Brian McGregor, a song about Americans. Yeah. Uh, it was a real turning point at that time, and, and WABC played it very strict. Now, Maria Moldau, first off, you know, Greenwich Village in a jug band, you know, sure. that wasn't my scene. And um, she was like a Bonnie Raitt, you know, this kind of a hip, hip girl, you know, just mm -hmm. wearing tie-dye, tie-dye cut-off kind of stuff, barefoot and swiveling her hips, doing these big Mama Thornton songs. Wasn't she, wasn't she from uh, Jim Queskin jug band? Yes, yeah, she that? was. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. And, she, and, and her, you know, she was so good looking and sexy, like the, like the Carly Simon covers. Uh, that played into it. And she had songs like, uh, it ain't the meat, it's the motion. Uh, you know, so these were kind of racy, <laughs> Betty Boopish uh, tracks. And, and so that one was hard, really hard to swallow. Uh, to mm. But I, I had a million clunkers, guys. But it, it's interesting to say this, because I was always worried I'd be confronted of, Dave, what do you think? And I got to tell you, nobody ever asked me, what do you think? So I was never in a bind. Uh, <laughs> To, to, to be responsible for liking. Uh, so, probably because they were used to seeing those guys with the two-inch thick glasses and the trench coats coming. <laughs> to promote them. You know, and I don't want to bad rap this other guy, and he'll be in my next book, but Barry Manilow, some of those records, Weekend in New England. When oh, my show, when, when oh you're talking... You're talking a sensitive topic in my household. Well, because listen, I worked my, a lot. Of, I worked. I worked at the Copa, which was a great song. But Barry was very flamboyant. Really loved to show off. And mm -hmm. uh, the night Clive gave me that record and say, you know, sp spend a weekend only playing this record. I was like, whoa, okay. Um, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> this may be the only time we talk about Barry Manilow on the show. 
Probably. <laughs> oh my uh. god. Because I, because I, I hate to admit this, uh, and I'm going to admit it, but my wife and my uh, sister-in-law were huge fans of of Manilo, and we saw him at that period. We paid, I think it was twenty dollars, which was pretty high in those days, and, and we saw him. I think it was around the Copacabana time, Dave. Um, mm-hmm. He played Circle. He played Circle Star. I don't know if do you, you you remember Circle Star Theater out here. I do. Yeah, he played Circle Star Theater, and we saw that show, and. Um, I think it was Circle Star, I'm pretty sure. But anyway, we, we saw that show at the time, and it was, um, I remember that very well. But anyway, yeah. um, Alan, Alan, I've been talking a lot. You guys got anything else? Actually, I do. Um, Dave, you just mentioned Clive. Now, I know you were based on, uh, you know, on the East Coast when you were with, uh, with WIA or, I guess, Warners, technically. But uh, did you ever, ever have any, uh, any connection at all with uh, Joe Smith, uh, you know the rec- oh, the right. recently passed I don't know, high mucky muck at, at Warner's. Joe Smith um, was a DJ, right, in Boston, and uh, so he had that very flamboyant, happy, slap me five, always smiling, always in a good mood. When I got to Warner Brothers, uh, this was early days of the film or video, uh, probably video, and they'd send a videotape of Joe Smith like Cal Worthington selling cars on a car lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on each car window, on the windshield, was an album from either Tower Power, Randy Newman, uh, Gordon Lightfoot, uh, those kind of things. And he did a stand-up routine that was out of this world. Nothing could have been funnier. And uh, he embraced me. He uh, he came to the townhouse. He knew Rick Sklar. Uh, he knew the artist. He, uh, he, he was one of the few leaders I worked for that walked the walk as I did. Uh, you know, he, he had been there. Many uh, presidents of record companies, some of them came from sales and they think promotion people are just airheads talking all the time. Uh-huh. I stopped talking all the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you get a president of a company that comes from press and publicity. So that then when you get a Paul McCartney, they're going to be driven to go that way with the artist. And then you, then you get a guy that was coming from radio who really knew the importance of the radio and, and, and Joe was that guy. And you, when you're with Joe Smith and you're around artists like Frank Sinatra, which I didn't even put in my book, um, you know, you're an amazing heir. And here I am with hair, hair down on my shoulders, uh, meeting Frank Sinatra. You know, oh, 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 you, you got you to say something about that. Oh, you, I'll tell you, you to you right to... now. We had to go meet him at the, at the secret, secret door of the, the Waldorf Astoria where he comes down from because he was living there. And he wanted to go over to WNEW where he had once worked. He knew William B. Williams. Sure. Um, oh. and, and he knew everybody. And this is the old NEW where it was like when he was there on mm-hmm. Fifth Avenue. And uh, he was playing for the main event, his, his big live concert in Madison Square Garden. Right. So here he comes down and he meets me with Joe Smith. He goes, you got to be kidding me. Who, 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 you got to be kidding me. And he sees that really long hair. He goes, Wow. <laughs> Hop in. So we get in the, the, the limousine, and he's with Jilly. Right? Jilly owned the restaurant on 55th Street, his, 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 his guy. So uh, Frank says, hey, Jilly, fix this kid a drink. What are you drinking? I said, uh, I'll have a wine. Wine? <laughs> <laughs> Jilly, fix this kid a drink. You know, it's, it's, it's scotch and soda. That, you know, I can't even sip it. Without, it's like trying to smoke a cigarette in front of your parents and choking like a – choking crazy like a horse. And – um we go over to the radio station, and uh, William B. He walks in on William B. And William B. goes, "Frank, give me a second. I'm finishing up here." He goes, "Wow, what? I'm here. It stopped. I'm not. I'm walking in. I'm talking. Don't stop me." He goes, "No, no. Yes. These, we're giving away this this uh, honeymoon gift for these kids. You know, they've been sending in pictures of where they're going to go on their honeymoon. And we're calling this girl. She won. She's going to be telling her husband. Hold on. So the, the, this, they go. You know, we're calling, and the phone's ringing, and this girl goes, "Hello." And they go, hi, William B. Williams uh, calling. You've won the contest uh, you know, for a honeymoon for two. And uh, I know when you get married next month, your husband's really going to love this. She goes, hold on, he's right here. He's in bed with her. So yeah. <laughs> Sinatra goes, hang on, no, hang up on that bitch. <laughs> Let's move this along. So, <laughs> so it's 10 to 2, and William B. Williams goes, Frank, uh, let me finish this up. 2 o'clock, we go to news. We'll start it up. Uh, we'll start you on at 2.15. goes, 2.15, I'm out of here. Start it now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so by the time we get back to the Waldorf Astoria, Frank says to me, hey, listen, 
here's two tickets. I want to see your mother, not you. You understand me? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, really That's fun. wonderful. That's great. Thanks that's for letting great. me share that. I didn't know that was oh, coming right. up tonight. <laughs> yeah, that, that's fantastic. Alan, you, you got to, something else you want to ask him? Yeah, I guess I'm I'm just focused on on some of the stuff that's going to be in the capital book, but um, I guess I'll have to wait for that. And uh, what, what year did you say that was going to come out? Is it going to come out before Lewison's next month? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I've actually uh, that's funny, and I'm actually a third of the way through it. I know where the end zone is on this one, and it's a beauty, man. I really mean this, and I, I hope I'm able to articulate. Uh, you know everything that went on there. You got to imagine. You know we walked into oh, yeah. a big scene there. There was some big records, and you know McCartney came back to the label. Tina Turner, Duran yep. Duran, Bob Seger. It, it's unbelievable the big big hits that we had there in that decade. And uh, the ending I put on this book is a Corker Boys. Great. Get, uh, when did you move me- west? Oh, uh, you know it's funny. I uh, was working at Sony Red Ink. I put in a good five years, and. Um, I'd actually uh, fallen in love with this woman named Judy, who I had met at Capitol Records when I joined them in 1980. And but I was the New York guy; she was the West Coast gal. She worked at Capitol in the Tower 33 years. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we hooked up, um, and I knew I wanted to come to California. And I've been with Judy now for 10 years. I love it out here, fellas. Your nose doesn't get cold. Your ears don't get cold. You don't have to buckle up the, your jacket in the front. Well, maybe not in L.A. you don't, Dave. Uh, but... you go. <laughs> <laughs> right. Mark Twain, or the coldest winter I ever felt was a summer in San Francisco. There you go. Wow. And actually, actually, I know Judy. Uh, I've worked with Judy. I've worked... Judy was when Judy was at Capitol. I worked with uh, her when I was uh, in the newspaper, and um, I know and, uh, she's handling the book now. So yes, it, you know she's quiet and shy, but fellas, and she's behind the scenes as I was being a promotion man behind the bands and, and kept my distance. But uh, the archives that she has, the day she started at Capitol, Ringo and John were there. That just gives you a mm. that mm. stuff, and. Um, it's 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 thrilling, and and I also want to finish by saying, or not finish, but say that Alan picked up on that promotion man thing, and I always felt that when I was writing this book, there were books about A and R people, books about artists, but there I hadn't seen anything, you know, from the promotion man perspective, and I wanted to go deep and really share it and get it out there, and you know, and I'm glad that I I did, and and it's understood, and people get a real feel for for the gig. Yeah, definitely. We're, we're just we're just about out of time, but Dave, I wanted to ask if you would. Do a real short Beatles story that uh, that uh, maybe give a, a taste of what what people can expect for a Beatles story in the in the next book. Okay, I'll give you a great one, and I think that, Alan, I'm sorry if uh, you're sawing your ear off. You've been with me and a great pal my whole ride, you know, um, and I love you very much. You've always been a great supporter, but I'll never forget the day at Capitol. It's just so funny. The uh, I think it was Press to Play came out, and we're having a party for Paul uh, and Linda at um, Radio City Music Hall. Mm-hmm. And um, you could feel the commotion of the photographers and, and the press people uh, pressing, uh, no pun intended, as Paul was entering. So I was kind of relaxed and in the back, and I was standing with Basker Menon, who was their chairman, and Don Zimmerman, the president, a couple of bigwigs. And, um, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, McCartney came upon us. There was no time to say he's walking towards us, he was upon us. And uh, Basker and, and Don were recognized immediately by Paul. You know, immediately. It was unbelievable to share that, you know, where Paul says, hi, guys. Not like people going, hi, Paul. It was so great. And they went out of their way to say, Paul, this is Dave Morrell. He works for us. He's in New York. And uh, he, he's, a, he's a big Beatle fan, and he loves the new album. And McCartney darts his whole body, shifted his body, shifted his leg weight, shifted himself and looked at me and said, Dave, nice to meet you. Uh, what song you like off the new album? You know, one of the deeper tracks. What do you like? And I'm standing with Basker Menon, so I said, move over, Basker. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, move over, Basker. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but then he started to tell me about, you know, it's a song about busking in the subways in England. And uh, it was really fun. And then I let him do his thing. And uh, Linda, Linda was with uh, Danny, Danny Fields, 
who she'd known okay. through Sixteen Magazine, sure. and mm -hmm. and he was a wonderful dear, and I use that word in capital letters, dear friend of hers. Oh. Lily and Roxon, there was a whole scene there with the press, mm -hmm. her being a photographer, and I was watching this go down, and then Linda says, "Hey, anybody got anything rolled?" And oh. I had I had one with me, so I said, "Yeah." So with me and her and Danny, I have Polaroids of this. I've had my Polaroid camera, it's just the three of us. We went up to the balcony at Radio City Music Hall and we're puffing away. And she stood there gazing at the screen, nobody in the whole place. And she goes, oh boy, when I was a young girl, I loved coming here. Oh boy, Dave, were you ever here? I said, yes, once, I saw a movie here. Oh, what movie was it, Dave? I said, The Yellow Rolls Royce. She says, what a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I, I like that movie. She goes, oh, all right. She says, hey, I'm really stoned. Let's go downstairs now. So she's got me by the arm and Danny on the other arm, and we walk over to the table where Paul is, and Paul looks up at her and goes, oh, Linda's got the munchies. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, 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 Linda, bring, bring young Dave and sit right here. So it was Paul, Linda, and me. Uh, and then, you know, some big wigs. And... Um, you know, I was paranoid. Now I'm stoned, and there's, you know, I'm not supposed to be, and I'm at this table. And um, so Paul goes, so what's happening, Dave? And I said, well, you know, I just noticed in the new Capitol catalog uh, that the Beatles, uh, I don't know if it's Sessions or Rarities, I'll get my notes right, and it's coming out. And he goes, no, no. I said, no, no, it's, it's so far coming out. It's in the catalog. The salesmen are selling it. Uh, he goes, what's on it? I go, well, I, you know, I'm the walrus. Take 20. Take 20? Who picked Take 20? I said, I don't know. He says, why take 20? I said, I don't know. He says, geez, well, you know, I'll tell you something. You ought to, you know, the final version was the one, man. The final version was the one. I don't know about that one. I said, okay. I said, what about songs that, um, you know, we heard about, but, uh, you know, that, were, that we heard about you wrote, but we never heard you do it. He goes, like what? I go, uh, come and get it. I said, that sounds exactly like Badfinger. Exactly. He goes, that's right. I told the boys, do it exactly this way, you'll have a hit. Exactly. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, good one. So I said, what about songs that no one has ever heard before? He says, name one. I said, that means a lot. And all of a sudden, he puts his fingers by his, by his neck, like his turkey neck, and he's pulling on it. And he goes, can't you see? He goes, rubbish, rubbish. I wouldn't want anyone to hear that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then he said, you know, when you go home tonight, Go oh, listen to all of these songs, the final versions of I'm the Walrus Man. That's the one. And he, he was so, so charming and turned on. And then, you know, when the moment was really righteous. Now, man, I'm working at the record company. And I, can't, I can't jump in on stuff, you know, and ask for autographs. I can't do that. I'm a professional. But I yanked out that butcher cover. And he goes, wow. He said, if I hadn't seen the, the signature on here, and he's pointing to Lennon, I'd nick this off you. He says, I haven't seen one of these in years. And I said, would you sign it for him? And he said, sure. And I got a nice picture of him signing it. So uh, that's, a, that's a nice treasure story that I'll, I'll share with you. And then I got to meet and work with him on that world tour and be with him a lot, talk to him about Astrid and Hamburg. Mm. So I'll be sharing that too. Oh, man, right. I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't want this to end, but I think we, yeah. we're, we've about run out of time. Well, they're closing El Pescatore Benito here on 56th Street. Now <laughs> picking up the tab as we have our final. Uh, there we go. Martin. Al, 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 you got any last uh, thing you want to you jump in with? No, I think I think we probably uh, we probably should wrap it up. Yeah, really, Dave. <laughs> thank you very very much. I'm I'm and uh, one of these days we're going to get Ron in, in here. Uh, we yes, gotta, yeah, gotta absolutely. Run. He um, was dying to do it. I'll close by saying he was dying to do it. He's got a million great stories in the Naked City. He's toppermost of the poppermost. He blew my mind once again last week with the things that he's up to and what he's doing. I don't want to share it. It's his uh, ownership. And um, he really wanted to be on here tonight. And I'll be talking to him in a moment. And I just want to say to Alan Cozen, man, it's been a long time. And I love you. And your giggle and your funness is always with me. <laughs> and Al, uh, I could sit and talk with Al chair to chair for two, 10 days and never come up for breath. And we, had a, we had a great visit at, the, at the, the L.A. Fest for Beatles fans about, I guess now, a little over a year ago. And it was as quick and enjoyable a half hour or so as I think I've ever had there. It was so much fun. 
Thank you. And Steve, you know, you're the best. I love working with you, uh, reading your material. Um, you've been such a great supporter today, Morel. Uh, I really owe you one, and I'm very grateful to be on the show today, fellas. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to have you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's been great to have you. And like I said, I wish this could go on for another hour or two. But anyway, folks, this has been uh, things we said today. Um, Al, uh, you want to give out some contact information? Uh, yeah, uh, just uh, through Twitter at uh, at asus a s u s s four nine or on uh, or on Facebook at Al Sussman, where uh, as I mentioned, you're likely almost at any time to suddenly see a uh, a, a, a survey from Corvettes from 1972 pop up, courtesy of Dave Morell. Okay, Alan, you. Oh, probably the easiest way to get to me is Facebook, either Alan Cozen or my alter ego, Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, or you can send me an email at alancozen at gmail.com. And for me, uh, I'm, I have my own Facebook page. Um, uh, you can email me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. You can email the show at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We also have two Facebook pages, a group page and a radio show page, and you can uh, you can uh, contact us on Twitter at Things We Said Fab, and uh, so we will see you all next week, same place, uh, you can get us on Podbean, on YouTube, on iTunes, we are everywhere, uh, take us with you to the gym, which I have done several times, and it's a lot of fun to, to hear us. Who knows what we'll have next week, but we will be back with you. Thanks for listening, everyone, and we will see you next time. Bye.